Pels, are you going to make us smile today? Me? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Um, depending on your perspective, I think what I have to say is either um, interesting and helpful to your own personal situation or totally disheartening if you're thinking about affordability and people. Ah, with needs. I hear you. It's bleak. So hello everyone, can you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> Awesome, thank you. So I'm sitting here alone in the conference room. I'm so glad you all could join. We'll just wait another minute or two since it's not quite three o'clock. And we've got a few more people logging in, so that's great. And thank you so much, Bill, for joining us from afar. Rob. All right, well, it's 301. We've got a forum here. I'm only uh, heard from one other person that I was expecting. Trisha could not make it today, so uh, maybe they'll join us late, but in the interest of time, let's go ahead and get started. And I was actually going to propose that we switch and we bring the new business right up to the top of the agenda since we have Pels visiting us, um, that maybe we could start right in with him and we can take care of the rest of our business afterwards in case he'd like to go. Is that all right with everyone here? Yes, I see one person nodding, two, at least two people nodding. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So without any further ado, uh, we have Pels Matthews here with us. Um, most of you know Pels. He's a real estate agent here in town with William Ravis. And um, he also handles commercial real estate, which is, is of interest to all of us um, as we kind of keep our eyes on that, as well as the housing market in general. Oh, good. Rudy's here coming in person. This is great. Um, so he has, I, I asked him to come and just share some thoughts on the housing market and where it is now, what he thinks is going on, sort of reflecting back on the COVID. We all know we had a boom in, during COVID times. And uh, so he's here to share some information with us. Hello. Rudy, welcome back. Good to see you. Good to see you. I have uh, the agenda and uh, a presentation there on the table. Cool, thank you. Um, so I'll just turn it over to Pels. And Pels, just so you know the presentation, I have it on my computer if you want me, if you would like me to share it or you can if you- Let me see if I can share it from my, um, let's see. 
Disabled. Participant sharing is disabled. So why don't you share it from yours, Michelle? Would be okay. I'll just share it. Um, Do you want me to you. open it now? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so so thank you all for having me. Um, you, you know, I, uh, it's no surprise. I, I don't think to anyone that you know inventory as a general topic is is really um, really challenging for us. Um, you know, I put together some statistics here that will cover Washington and some of the immediate towns, just so you will have an opportunity to look and see kind of what's happened uh, in terms of inventory and pricing numbers. Um, you know, prices of closed transactions from pre-COVID to now are up, you know, 100%. Uh, rents are up, average rents are up 100%. Um, the number of active properties. Hello? Oh, we're here. Did it? Right. Did you just lose it? Did I lose it? Uh, no, I just heard somebody in the background. So, oh, sorry. Um, so, so double. Yeah. So, if you look at the averages, you know, you'll see what looks like a double. Now, I would tell you, pricing generically isn't a double. What's happened is um, we got sort of just through our late 2007 highs. Um, in theory, we've come back down a little bit uh, from the peak, um, largely driven by interest rates and economic uncertainty in the last, you know, six months especially. Um, but you know, this banking crisis in California and New York has had an impact. Uh, on the upper end, as, as much as interest rates has had an impact on the upper end. Um, but if you look, you know, just look at number of active listings for sale, if you go to page two, Michelle, this is sort of a nice uh, summary of sort of the area um, by town. You know, in, in, these are all March 30 of, to the end of March, end of the first quarter of the last five years. Um, so you can see inventory in Washington used to run between about 85 and 105 houses. Uh, so it was at 95 at the end of March of 2019. Pretty, pretty normal for the previous, you know, 10 years. Um, and then all of a sudden we had this slow and steady decline. Um, and now we're down to under 20 listings in the whole town. You know, and if you look at, you know, you call it a thousand housing units in town or, you know, we are at a tiny, less than 2% of our listings are for sale. Um, you know, it's a, just a very, very small number. Is that uh, because of availability or is that just the market driven? It, it's, a, it's a combination of a whole bunch of factors. Um, one, you know, there, there was kind of a generational turnover happening before COVID. Uh, some of that got accelerated during COVID. We've never had any real spec building. I mean, if you look at the, the developer projects that happen all around us that, you know, frankly, completely struggled until COVID, whether that's Chapog Crossing on, up on Old Mount Tom Road or the stuff off of 109, you know, the Walker Brook Estates uh, or the other one what they call Farm View or whatever it is on the other side of 109. Those things have limped along struggle, change developers, you know, and now the last person holding them at the time of COVID has probably done okay. Um, but the cost of construction, you know, has probably near doubled since 2007. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're back to 2007 pricing generically. So it's not very encouraging for, you know, new inventory. Um, you know, the building codes keep getting harder and harder. You know, as of this year, your ceiling has to be R60. You know, that's a super tough standard to meet. There's just little things that have incrementally made it really expensive to build housing. Um, you know, and, and I'm selling stuff at 80 to 85% of replacement costs in most cases right now. So again, still cheaper to buy an existing house than buy build a new house. Um, so all of that has kind of affected us. And then if you think about, you know, if you bought a house 
and your interest rates at you know sub three percent, which there are a lot of people out there with mortgages and low rates, you know today that mortgage is going to be seven percent. And, you know, so buying a house for half as much money, if you're trying to downsize, uh, your payment's actually going to be higher. You know, so that's a problem. Um, and so, you know, the people that own houses now that are sort of thinking about selling, like their big dilemma is where do I go? You know, what do I buy? You, know, you look at the Washington condominium market, you know, we used to always have two or three things in Beebrook, two or three things in Quarry Ridge. Now they almost trade on insider markets, right? I think the last couple of sales in Beebrook were all private inside deals. They don't ever hit the market. Um, you know, I listed something in Corey Ridge, sold it pretty quickly, you know, in the fours. So, you know, it's, it's just gonna, it's gonna be a challenge to address affordability you know, with one, you know, obviously we all aware of our zoning regulations. They're very challenging. Uh, state building code is very expensive. Uh, and material costs, you know, while plywood's not $125 a sheet, it's still 70 or 65. I mean, it's, you know, it's still a double from where it was in 2019. That includes the transportation, which has just gotten out of control. Yeah. The, yeah. yeah the, yeah, I mean, I and the well, energy I, to do it. Easily. Yeah, I mean, little little things. I I own a house in Roxbury. Right. Last spring, I was going to do an oil and stone treatment to the driveway. It was thirty seven hundred dollars. I didn't do it because I had contractor trucks coming and going. It's seventy five hundred to do the same job today. Yeah. Whoa, just a year. <laughs> yeah, away. one year. So oh. you know. <laughs> I mean, yeah, okay, plot, yeah, like I said, you know, people look at raw materials, they look at, you know, two by fours and, and plywood, which is sort of a semi raw material. Those prices have come down from the peak, but all your, all your manufactured stuff, I mean, windows, plumbing, uh, you know, trying to buy a schedule 40 pipe now, you know, you're paying five times what you paid pre-COVID for that stuff. Yeah. I mean, so this is really, I hate to say this, but this is really depressing to hear this. So, yeah. so, but it's absolutely true. And yeah. so do you see an end in sight? Um, you know, I, I am sort of generically telling my audience that, you know, inventory is coming from death, divorce and downsizing. You know, and sometimes, you know, people make real lifestyle choices to downsize, not necessarily a financial choice. It, it is often driven by that. Um, but I see, you know, I see a very quick turnover of, of listings when they come, uh, if they're well priced. I mean, there's super liquidity in the market today if you price well, uh, despite interest rates. Um, you know, the, the rental market, different market, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, you know, where I'm seeing some slowness now is in the two and a half to $5 million market. And that's driven by jitters in the general economy and in financing. I mean, uh, there is not an insignificant portion of our weekender community that is somehow related to the real estate business, whether they are developers in New York or they invest in mortgage bonds or they are lenders, they see a world of pain. Right. Because, you know, you've got top tier landlords in New York giving back the keys on multifamily and, and office buildings. Uh, if you try to get financing for anything other than a hotel or a market rate um, multifamily project right now, it's closed. You know, um, there and there's just a, there's something like 40 percent of all office buildings in Manhattan have to be refinanced in the next four years. Yeah. You know, and they, and it's that's very very scary to these guys, and so they're now that's being a little, a little more cautious. Um, you know, which last summer when rates were going up, they didn't seem to care, right? That market was still good. But if you look at the percentage of listings, like look at if you look in that table on the far right for Washington, we see the average listing price. Yeah, so we've gone from eight hundred thousand to a million eight. You know, and if I if I pull up the inventory in Washington right now on my phone, there might be two houses below two million dollars on the market. Might be, 
Um, I know there's one on my get for a million something. Um, then there's the one on uh, uh, Sandstrom for like in the fours, but that's a 700 square foot shoebox, right? Um, you know, there. if your budget's a half, a, like I have a client now whose budget is a half a million dollars and it, it's brutal. You know, something came on in Roxbury for 550. We bid 626, 76, so 126,000 over. We did not get it. Well, you know, that, 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 is, that really, I hate hearing that. It's frightening. It is frightening. I really hate hearing that. It, it, and, it, it uh, is. Yeah. Depressing. Yeah. It, it's the other thing that would be interesting to see is what the inventory of product availability would be based on price range. So well, I was just going to ask. I can, I can give you that right now if you hang on one second. Um, sure. I'm gonna give you in Washington today, um, there are two properties under 500,000. There is that, sorry, that thing on Sandstrom is not in the four, Sandstrom is not in the fours. So I apologize. It's 275. Uh, but again, it's 725 square feet. It's basically a studio. Um, so part and, of yeah, and it needs work. Right, yeah. And it needs work. And it's 275. So that's, you know, that's at or above where I used to sell Corey Ridge condos. Right. You know, not that long ago. Oh, not that long ago. You know, an unrenovated B Brooks used to sell for 175. Not anymore. You know, there was one that came on at 375. I bid full price. I didn't get it. So the market's so inflated. So, you know, Kels, just out of curiosity, do you yeah. see um, the under? I'm trying to. Does the do the under five hundred or the under under a million? Does that move the same way as the two million and up? It's you know. Moving, well, it's moving much faster now if it's well priced or isn't just a complete hellhole. You, you only have two houses under a half a million. You have that one on Sandstrom. You have the one on Litchfield Turnpike, which is on the opposite side from Community Table. It's sort of down in the hollow there with the swamp behind it. That yeah. is on for 330. Um, and then your next cheapest listing is a million 275. Like and there are, yeah, right, right. Then there, there, so there's nothing between 500 and a million. Yeah, um, one, two, three, four houses between one million two seventy five and one million three fifty. I will tell you categorically, three of them are overpriced. One is overpriced by a half a million. The other two are overpriced by at least two hundred seventy five thousand. Right? They're just not. That's a separate subject which we'll we'll get to. Um, and then you jump to 2.2 million or better or higher. And there are more houses. Let's see if I go to 3 million, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. There are 11 houses at 3 million or more out of 21. So more than 50% of all inventory is over $3 million. It's over three. And did, are the ones at 3 million and above moving at the same rate as they used to, or is that slowing um, down as well? Well, he, the honest answer is no. Um, they, most of them have aspirational pricing on them. I did just sell one on Monday that was asking 2,850, so pretty close. It was a private listing, not on, not online, so no one will see it. Um, it's selling for a little bit below that, but not a lot, um, but it was fairly priced. Um, I have another one, an off-market listing at 2.9. I brought a 2.6 offer, and the seller's like, no, if I don't get my number, I don't care, right? So there is a lot of that going on. Buyer attitude. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just interesting because we know that there's a shortage of houses under 500,000, and those clearly are moving fast. But, but the but upper like, end of the market doesn't always move the same way as the lower end. No, um, it That's does not. Right. Um, it's, you know, it's affected by different things. Um, you know, and you've got, if you look at the inventory in Washington, one, two, three, four, 
going on. What you're telling us is well, then spot on. Right. I'm going to tell you just it so is. so six That's out of the 20, yeah six out of the twenty one active listings are all owned by the same person. Whoa. And that, oh. and that, <laughs> and all, all six of those listings, in my professional opinion, are overpriced. And they, okay. have, they have been on the market for a while, either softly or on the MLS. Um, gotcha. And that's a reflection of the, of the rental market, which is what we'll move to next. So Michelle, if you can go down to the rental page, I mean, you, you can look at the other stuff, the stuff in the middle there, it's basically a non-event. Right. I mean, the only yeah. thing that's coming to be, yeah. I mean, the, the numbers are so small. Almost know, nothing. Yeah. yeah. But if you yeah. look at the new Milford condo sales, you know, it'll give you a sense, right? Active listings are down a lot, and the average um, list and closing prices are up a lot. So, you know, if you're going to look at a trend, that's a good place to find enough statistical data to pull a trend out of. Okay. Yeah, and on the condos too. I, I mean, even the condos and the multifamilies have uh, increased astronomically. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so that's you know, a, a two family just sold in Washington for 700000 I just uh, saw that. I mean, I, honest, you know, I get a nice looking structure in a good location. But if you're a landlord buying that building for a rent roll, it's worth about two hundred fifty grand. And someone paid seven hundred thousand dollars for it. So I know. You know, no, no landlord is going to buy that building who doesn't have some ulterior motive, right? And, you know whether that's the school. There's a master plan. Yeah. Well, that that's I know that one because it's on my street, and the second apartment is so quirky. It, it would be much better just turned back into a one family or something. But that's another story. But there's such desperate need for entry yeah. level rentals. So. Okay. So let's go down to the next page. Yes, so, I, and I wanted to ask about that, but you go yeah. first. So, so obviously the rental inventory is not down as much as the for sale inventory. Uh, but if you look at the pricing, again, the pricing seem, appears to have doubled, right? Your average close price, your average list price uh, from 19 to 23. Uh, it's come down from the absolute peak. I mean, during the height of COVID, I could have rented your garage for $8,000 a month, right? It was just total insanity. Um, and that's come, that's come down. And we're, we're sort of back to normal pricing. And we're actually, I believe, below normal pricing on the, what I call weekender rentals. Well, um, and before, before we go on, I, if you could explain, because this, I think, is so deceiving. If you look at, at the prices for Washington versus the prices for Milford, you know, the, the Milford prices are what you would, ex, you know, a working family renting a two-bedroom apartment. That's, yeah. Those are monthly rents that you would expect. Right. And, and that's 23, why I, 11, that, the, this is the vaca vacation skews this whole it, thing. It, 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 it totally does. Right. It totally does. does. That's why I that's why I included New Milford does. so that you guys could see what's happened. It's it, noise it, though. But you got this COVID premium even in the what I will call the, the working class apartments, and it hasn't abated, right? So the premium that happened in the weekender rental market has abated back to normal. The premium for you know, your $1,200, $1,500 a month rental has not abated because yeah. there's such demand, so little inventory. So we listed something That's the other big day big. for, for 1100 bucks a month uh, on Beebrook Road, across from the firehouse. Um, a studio apartment. Uh, we had 15 inquiries, 10 showings, four offers, and they accepted one offer in, you know, two days. Um, yeah, and it's and it's a tough situation. I mean, it's a it's not an ideal setup. We had a single mother. We had couples. We had a single guy, you know, who works in the service industry. Um, we've had, you know, we had a bunch of different demographics, so it's hard to generalize about who's looking. Um, but under two thousand, there's nothing, you know. And you know, if you make 45 or 50 grand a year 
that's kind of your budget. Absolutely. And that's, gonna, know, and that's a struggle. I want, I'm going to put my, my, my housing hat, my affordable housing hat on for just a second and ask you a question because it's those 2000 and under rents, the working family, the entry mm -hmm. level, you know, whether it's first time in the job market or young family, is there an increased demand for that? Like, is it, what, what's the demand for that? Is that something we as a town should be looking to try to facilitate? As I guess, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I would argue 100%, you know, and I, I have looked at parcels, you, you know, for the, and I know, I don't know if they've spoken to you, but I know they've spoken to Jim, um, the folks from Vessel Technologies. You know, yeah. So, you know, we've looked at parcels in town, um, you know, for his kind of stuff, if it makes sense, we can throw out zoning because it would be an 830G application anyway. Um, but there's still the health issues, right? There's still septics. There's still, you know, if you have more than, I think it's 22 units or something like that, it's considered a public water system. So, you know, that adds a whole layer of complexity and cost to the owner developer that, you know, he's really trying to find sites on town water, town sewer. We have, which we don't which, have, yeah. which we don't have, and he yeah. has he has bid on sites in New Milford, um, has I think got an option on one, the one that he tried to do with me, we lost, we didn't get it, we went to somebody else. Uh, he's got a project that's starting in New London, so you know there will be a physical project here in Connecticut. Uh, he's got one in Newark that opened, um, you know, and I would you know. There are sites in town that I think it would be interesting for, um, you know, whether that's the old Jack's site, um, you know, the, the, the town seems committed to the community center in the old garage site, but that again, could have been a location um, for him to consider, um, you know, but other than that, you know, where are you gonna go? I mean, yeah. People want so much money for their land now that it's really hard. You know, it's really, really hard. And, you know, he, you know, in some cases, he's getting land from cities who are giving, giving him land. You know, that's been uh, reclaimed for non-payment of taxes or abandonment or whatever. Um, and so that's obviously Jesus. very helpful. His his model is no get rich quick model, right? I mean, it's it's a thin margin business that is trying to do something helpful, and you know I've been trying to help him, uh, but in our communities, it is very very challenging. It you know? is really hard. It is. Our, our, I see Wayne's got his hand up. He's yeah. been patient. I want to let him jump in for a second. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Um, uh, pals, of course, you know, I'm, I'm the guy with the long range view here. So, uh, I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot because we're friends, uh, <laughs> and okay. You're, you're king for a day. All right. And there's one thing you could do here in Washington to, to alleviate this issue and you're king for a day. What would it be? Well, I would allow multi-family zoning, multi-family housing by right, uh, certainly with things like greater lot coverage allowances. Or, you know, I would make it so that there's not this huge expensive hurdle to try to overcome. Um, you know, we if we are not proactive about it, you know, it's going to, I mean, we, we're just going to be a resort town at some point. I mean, you know, there are always going to be some affordable houses, but they're never going to trade. They're going to get like handed down from family to family. Um, and so, you know, I, I would seriously, I mean, I would, you know, all your dwelling density, your soil zonings, your setbacks, your height restrictions. I mean, you know, you, you can't build over two stories. It just gets more expensive, right? The, the wider your house, the more expensive it is. Um, you know, these are all things that, you know, I know that they're different from what we have, but if we don't address them, we're going to run out of affordable places to live. Yeah. And, you know, 
you know, I get, I get now weekender, you know, entry level weekenders looking at properties that used to be owned by full-time families and they buy them, they fix them up, they make them nice. And then they're not affordable for full-timers anymore. Yeah. You know, and, and, you know, it's just, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's a bigger problem than just Washington. I don't, you know, mean to just pick on us, but I would say if you look at the towns in Litchfield County, you know, there's probably nobody with harder zoning than us for, for this kind of development. It's yeah. really, it's discouraging to people who want to do it. And, you know, I understand the balance of it. Um, you know, I think, you know, there is, there is kind of an equalization happening in the high end rental. And the reason that you, one of the reasons you see that my average list and average close price is down a lot on the Washington rentals is because I think something like 30% of the people we sold houses to during COVID have them on Airbnb now. I mean, yes. Airbnb's inventory is pretty big relative to what it was prior. Um, the other day I looked, there were 120 houses in Litchfield County with pools available for the summer on Airbnb. So that's putting oh. pressure that's putting pressure on my ability to do my 20, 25, 30, $35,000 monthly rentals because this next generation just wants to rent for two weekends. They don't want to pay for the whole month. Um, and so it's interesting. Uh, almost none of the houses we sold during the COVID pandemic have resold. I think that's a nod to our quality of life. Um, you it's know, you know, I, listen, and if the if the stock of, I know there's been some bubble up around short-term rentals around various parts of town, you know, if that stock continues to rise, I think at some level, you'll start to have more friction between, you know, owners and renters, um, you know, and whether we end up with some kind of short-term rental ordinance, you know, I have no idea. Um, I know that it's come up at zoning already. There have been a couple of issues. There are a couple houses over yeah. on the well, lake. That have, in particular, it's been yeah. And I, and, yeah, so they've talked about, I don't really know what, what we could, what ordinances would look like. I know they're starting to put some in place around the state. Um, yeah. So there are some examples. Does the IWC shares the same uh wetlands officer janelle you know janelle right yeah so she handles the, all the areas around all the land issues of which there have been quite a few lately yeah, yeah. Uh, around the lake yeah yeah right yeah right, right. right, right. that happened and but so, you know it's I mean, not it's... It's, I, but one question i had was this is really really good data and really interesting information that you put together here which really has said a lot of the story of what's going on. But is there any also seasonality in your data that you found? Um, not really. Um, you, you, know, um, uh, you know, I give you some trailing 12 month data there. So you got a sense to sort of see what's happened over the, the previous 12 months. That's what I was wondering. Um, you know, yeah. 12 months. Yeah. So, okay. so yeah. you know, and I, I've always said to people like, oh, they say, oh, I want to list my house in the spring. I'm like, half of my weekend buyers are getting paid in December and January. Like they want to buy a house in December and January and then have it ready for the summer. So, you know, we don't have that big school year push. Um, we do get some private school parents who rent for the school year here. That is a real market for us. Um, they tend to pay higher rents than full-timers pay. And some of them aren't even here. They just want a house. Uh, some of them do stay or come occasionally. Um, but the high end, yeah, the high-end rental market is challenged. Uh, you can see, you know, there's one gentleman that has, you know, six of his houses that he owns in Washington for sale. He owns more in Washington. Um, I think he would sell anything at this point. Um, you know, his rental market has been challenged severely over the last four or five months. Um, and he's got debt on everything and, you know, but it's affecting like 
you know, I have people who they're older couples, they've rented their house for August every year for a certain amount, and they've gone to visit their grandkids in Nantucket or Maine or whatever. And now I can't get them that same amount of money and or I can't rent the house at all because they haven't been updated in 25 years. And, you know, there's a disconnect between what the 35, 45 year old renter is looking for and what, you know, my parents live in. Right. So. Right. And so then are they going to be able to keep those houses? Are they going to be able to take those vacations? Like, so it is affecting everybody at some level. Um, but I, you know, I'm that, that's it's interesting that, that Airbnb is such a game changer for the way rentals have worked in the past here. Uh, it has definitely affected us. Um, you know, COVID, obviously, you know, you could literally rent anything right during COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but now, you know, people are picky again. People, my buyers want the house. They don't need a house. You know, it's very, it's so a the market market. switch. It's made it's a transition a little, one way to the other way. Yeah, I mean, and, and gotcha. that's, you know, and if you, again, if you look at that, you know, even the 2 million and up listings, which are 70% of what we have listed, you know, some of those sellers are aspirational. They think the prices are up 15% over last year. And I'm like, if you really want to sell it, they're not. Um, but it still doesn't mean it's affordable to your average person. You know? No, but just curiously though, why would you say that occurred? Was there a particular event that caused that to happen? Uh, there was the combination of- Besides COVID? Well, there was a combination of rising interest rates because now, you know, money's not free, right? Your money that's been sitting in your bank account earning nothing is now earning four, four and a half percent. So there's opportunity cost, uh, you know, and three quarters of the people who bought houses for cash really got a mortgage or they borrowed the money against their stock portfolio because it was free. And now that stuff's expensive or, you know, they right. took a five one IO and that's going to reset. So, but, you know- People are, you know, people are just being more cautious at the high end. Um, you know, the economic signals are very mixed. You know, we've yeah. had tremendous number of tech layoffs, you know, and it's happened in the, in, in New York. Um, you know, bonuses are going to be down tremendously at the investment banks. Um, so, you know, each of those is a little factor that has sort of brought us to where we are today. Um, I can still I've get heard too that the job market right now is really rough. I mean, rougher than it's ever been. What they put put you through. I have a friend that was looking for a job, and I, I know I'm getting off the subject, but it's related. Well, it's been brutal it's for changing. Them. It's changing. Yeah, because for a while it was the employees market. We couldn't yeah. find employees, and now it's. I hear it. It's changing. But... So you're you're absolutely right. But if you look at look at the service industries, right? I mean, look at the Mayflower is trying to attract workers. They cannot get help. They, no, you know, no. my my the guy who's painting my house right. lost one of his crewmen to a fifty five dollar an hour job painting houses. I mean, well, you know, it's crazy. <laughs> I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I know. If you send him my you way, <laughs> I mean, that's. That's one hundred and ten thousand dollars a year at you know forty five hours a week. Yeah, I mean, it's a, you know there is real inflation out there. You know, you just yeah. it's just it's a very weird time. Well, yeah. building materials are horrendous, absolutely yeah. horrendous. If some of it's un, pressure treated, it's almost unavailable in some cases. Yeah, so it's, so it's, it's still yeah. still. If you want to yeah. order windows from Marvin, it's fifty six weeks. Yeah. What? And the 56 weeks <laughs> wait, and the, price, the pricing is up 50% in the last year. I'll be placing this bond for my windows. That's uh, crazy. Yeah, that's so, crazy. So, so before we... You want, to, you want to talk about commercial a little bit? Yeah. Michelle, yeah. can I... Michelle, can I just can I mention something before we oh, move sure, on? Oh, sure, Lisa. Commercial? I did. Sorry, sorry. now because I'm sharing I my jumped screen, on. I can't, I can't see yeah, everyone. Yeah, I can hear. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I just a couple of the, hi pals. Thanks for joining us. Sure. Um, I wanted to just meant to say something about what Pels mentioned before about us becoming a resort town, or we're getting we're headed in that direction. 
And I personally feel that after this past winter business season, I feel like we are a resort town now. Um, you know, the pandemic was a big like bump for us, um, many of the businesses in town. And we've circled, we've now circled back after this winter, I feel back to where we were headed years ago and why we started economic development in the first place was to kind of discuss some of these issues that were trending. And those off season months um, are such a struggle for many businesses. And I feel like we've definitely circled back to that now. And, you know, we've talked about this numerous times about what was going to happen and economic development has been around for a while and how, you know, what the, what we were going to do about it. And it's been this many years and we still haven't done anything. And now we've trended exactly where we thought we were going to go. Um, right. And I completely agree with Pels and what I just wanted to emphasize that we are, we're not trending there. We are there. Like, I, I, here, I mean, it's crazy to me that hearing that there's no, I mean, the inventory, I mean, I've been looking myself, but it's, it's just insane. And the older houses, like the people that are here that are older, who, you know, obviously that will be, you know, dying at some point and their houses are going to come on the market. Those houses are so old. <laughs> I mean, like, like Pell said, the market of people that are looking for houses, there's no way, I mean, to pick up some of that stuff. It's crazy. Mm. No, I agree. And I, I want to just jump in on that point because it's something I've been thinking about. And and Wayne, I, I think, is still here with us as we've been looking at the trends. Um, and as we were doing our affordable housing plan, we, we've gotten, with the number of people in second homes, we're getting really close to a third. I mean, it depends on how you count the numbers and the census numbers are a little bit funky, but I'm wondering, is there a benchmark, like what, at what point are you a resort, what, a resort town or a bedroom, you know, whatever you want to call it, like what is, are there benchmarks for what makes a healthy, thriving community versus it, a, a, a resort community where you're having to ship in all of your clerks and service industry workers, like, does, does anyone know Kind of what the what what is the equilibrium that's ideal? Like, have we passed it already? I don't know. Uh, you know? The short answer is no. There is no set point because it's different for every place. I okay. mean, we're 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 not we're not a beach community, so there's you, there's there's not a, there's no way to really make an apple to apples comparison. The 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 one the one stat I could give you that might be relevant is that whenever I do comparisons with Washington to other towns in our neck of the woods, the, the town I always go towards is actually Salisbury. Um, it's roughly the same size geographically, it's the same size population-wise, it's affluent, it has a number, it, you know, it has a number of educational institutions, it has several distinct village centers. In, in many ways, it's a carbon copy of of Washington. Uh, I don't know about the real estate market, but Pels might agree with that to some extent. Um, we may be, like you say, we might be at a point where one out of three homes in Washington is a second home for someone else. Uh, we're, we're, we're approaching that. I know that Salisbury is well above that. They actually are around 40% of uh -huh. their house is, is a second home for someone else. And so then you know, do you consider Salisbury a resort? So I'll leave you with that. Yeah, I mean, so you know, Salisbury, like us, there's 60. You know, there's 60 yeah, I mean, houses for sale. There's, you know, one at 485,000. There are one, two, three, four, five queens, 75 and 995. There are two under 2 million. And then there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight houses above three million. Yeah. Is that Salisbury numbers? Yeah, Salisbury numbers. So pretty similar to ours, but a little heavier at the low end. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, but you know, some of that stuff, like they, one of them just came on, um, came on on Friday uh, for eight ninety five, and they had, I think, 10 offers uh, by Sunday. They're doing wow. best 
best and final by uh, was due at 12 o'clock today. So, you know, these that are was, residential offers. That's residential. With res residential, not commercial. Residential. And that's a, you know, that's a house that I would call sort of an entry level weekender house. So that's, I guess that's really interesting yeah. to me, Wayne, the stat of 40% second home owners. Yeah. And how does that stack up to what Lisa is experiencing as a business open in the winter, you know, with the, the market, the supply, or restaurants? How do they, what, how do they do in the winter? And, and does Salisbury, I don't know Salisbury well enough to know if they've got a business center. And I wonder if they struggle in the winter, you know? The answer is yes. Um, they have, they have technically three village centers, uh, Salisbury, Lakeville, and, um, or the racetrack, uh, Lime Rock, mm -hmm. and, which is kind of not really, Lime Rock's sort of their, kind of Woodville, it's, it's a village center in name only, there's really no businesses there, it's a message <laughs> of the village center, um, but Lakeville and Salisbury are actually functioning village centers like the depot and, and Preston. Um, Lakeville does a little better in the winter. The restaurants do okay. They get a lot of takeout work from the Hotchkiss School. Um, Salisbury, though, I mean, you know, Salisbury is kind of like the depot. You know, they have one market, they have one post office, they have, you know, it's kind of one gas station. It's kind of one of everything. And in the winter, those businesses, uh, they they struggle. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I would say, Wayne, one of my peeves is I think the census is sort of undercounting us that was done. It was sort of done just as COVID was taking off, correct? Oh, yeah, it was a disaster. Yeah. And so, you know, there have been a number of people who were formerly part-time residents who have transitioned to full-time, you know, and I, I do feel like, you know, you know, Lisa and I can't speak to your numbers, but I do feel like, yeah, it was slower again this winter because we didn't have everybody here, but it, to me, did feel busier than the winter of 1819 or even, you know, 1920 before COVID happened. Um, and I'd be curious what, if your numbers play out where it's a little better than that, or is it actually down um, or flat? You know, I have no idea because you know, your probably gross sales is probably a good indicator of, you know, sort of foot traffic. I just got a question. I just got a survey in the mail. I'm not a survey, a census in the mail. Did anyone else get one? I thought maybe because we were concerned about our numbers being off with the housing last year that maybe they sent another one out to our community. Anyone else get those? Wayne, you go. <laughs> you mean the Census Bureau? Yeah, it was a census. Wait, uh, maybe she's she's the two percent of our community that got surveyed for that. What's the what's the one they do annually? I forget what it's called. The American Community Survey. But I got, yeah. but it's from the census, and I got, I actually got three of them saying by law you have to fill this out. So I, I thought it was community wide. Yeah, she's right though. It's the U.S. U.S. Census Bureau. Is that what it is? It's the U.S. Census Bureau thing. Oh yeah, there you go. The official stamp. Yep. <laughs> okay, you're probably being asked to participate in what's called the American Community Survey. Uh, the Census Bureau picks basically one percent of the population at random and has them fill out various information from which they extrapolate data for communities. Um, in small towns like ours, it is notoriously inaccurate. Um, they, they process statistics in, in a range, typically. Uh, I think I've shared this before, but Michelle has heard this already. My favorite American Community Service Survey stat for Washington, Connecticut, which was from the 2010 census, was number of single Hispanic mothers, 11, Plus or minus 17. <laughs> I would take the under. Plus? It's quite a standard deviation. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, that so, is, so. A junk <laughs> We're too small 
for, yeah. for those numbers to be helpful well, to uh, us. And, <laughs> and, and for anybody who doesn't know, Planning Commission has been talking about this a lot because they're working on the next POCD and trying to figure out what kind of numbers to use because the census information is not is not complete for us. Are you surprised? I'm not surprised. No. Um, before, I was, it's been um, a bit of time here. Uh, do you have anything on the commercial that you wanted that you could share with us, Pals, before well, we let so, you go? Yeah, if you, if you want to talk about maybe the most idiosyncratic real estate market in the world, it's Washington's commercial real estate market. Um, <laughs> there, are, it's the full cornucopia. There, you know, nothing okay. is really alike. Um, you know, the most recent transaction was the Litchfield Savings Bank uh, condominium unit. Uh, I don't, you know, it traded very cheaply in the end, uh, cheaper than it should have, in my opinion. Uh, but I, I was shut out of that trend. Um, just, just out of curiosity, though, if you really thought about it and you wanted to stimulate the businesses in Washington, if you really wanted to do that, what would you do? I mean, do you have any? Well, you that's, know, that's our job. That's I know, no, but I'm just want to hear it from yeah, him. I mean, what his thought is. You know, I, you know, I I don't know if it's possible to find or allow you know newer technologies for septic, but septic is a real limiting factor. Okay. Uh, the health component of you know commercial yeah. development sort of means you know density and finding ways to deal with that i mean you know and it's it's unfortunate you know there have been some properties in town that have sold or come on the market that are commercially zoned or or they were and they have precedent as commercial use and they've just been so expensive right that it's just it's really hard to run a business there that actually makes sense on an operating basis you know you you're going to end up with what I call folly owners, you know, running folly projects. Um, and it, you know, we, we yeah. are severely land constrained in our commercial districts. Um, you know, we do uh, have the boat launch at Warwood. I'm, <laughs> I'm a weed inspector. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I do, you know, I do think that you know, we we have to think about what we want, you know, in terms of businesses. And, you know, I to be fair, though, sometimes people open the wrong businesses, you know, that mm -hmm. are, they don't give their clients what they want. And, you know, should they survive? It's I mean, they're lovely people. And I, you know, I we've seen a bunch of them. Um, and the, but that's part of life, I think it's, you know, you have to you have to be really thoughtful on opening a business here. You know, yeah. if your rent's going to be $3,000 a month, you know, and you got staffing and, you know, for a first floor retail space, you, you got to sell a lot of whatever it is on your shelf. Yeah. In, in a seasonal way. Well, yeah. that's what it's about. Yeah. If, but if you look at Bridget's, like, look at the eyeglass business that opened, you know, uh, next to the hen's nest. Mm -hmm. she, she's not really dependent on her retail sales out of that location, right? That is as much her manufacturing facility for handmade glassware as it is a, a sales site, right? I mean, 90% of her sales don't happen in Washington, Connecticut. And that's yeah. how she can afford to be there. Um, you know, I, I remember when Jay McLaughlin used to say, we break even at the shop and we make our money at horse shows. You know, I don't know if that's still the case or not, um, but, you know, people have to figure out how to generate enough revenue to have a real business, you know, and I, I don't, I don't really love seeing subsidizing not good businesses. It to me, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, right. that, that, that's a good point. So are you not, I'm just curious. Um, are you not seeing demand for commercial? We don't have a lot of commercial space do, available. Yeah, so I I have some people looking, you know, but again, they're picky and the choices are slim and, you know, they don't want to go to, a, like you look at Fleming's, yeah, which is now, you know, Fleming's is closed. It's available for rent again. You know, it's, it's an okay space, 
most of the people I have who want to look at it want to do a full gut. You know, they want the parking lot cleaned up and, you know, the Wyants aren't really willing to put any money into it. So, you know, they don't want to invest, you know, $150,000 into a restaurant reno fit out in a space that's not going to work. Yeah. You know? And so that's a challenge, you know, I, I mean, you know, John has done, you know, a remarkable job building a product that people want to go to in the White Horse, for example, but he struggles with parking. You know, you guys probably see it in all the zoning meeting minutes and you know, yeah, live complaining and Jim yeah. Dobson not letting him park across the street. I mean, he's got, you know, it's, right. it's capping yeah. his ability to, 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 to have revenue. We thought a guy was going to get hit there the other night. We went there the other night. Yeah. And the traffic through there does tend to move pretty fast. Sure. And and it's tricky because people are backing out of the restaurant. Yeah. And then I know he owns the space beyond that, but you're right. That That's a big issue. It's Absolutely. A, it's a dicey spot. It's also exactly. trying to back out of the supply yeah. on a busy day. Yeah. I mean, their parking well, is yeah, a little it's, challenging. It's, it's it's hard, but you know, you, you like and you look at the old Jack space, you know, they want yeah. they want a million five for it, and there's no building there. No. You know, no, no. Separate system and a parking lot. I mean, it's great. I mean, God, I know them quite well. I'm friends with them. I thought they paid way too sure. much for it given their what they thought they were gonna do. And now it's just a it's just a wasted opportunity. You know, yeah. we're gonna, we're gonna put our thinking caps on about that, but that's another conversation. So, yeah. so, so not a huge pent up demand for space and what space we There's, have yeah, is but, but working. You can rent, but you can rent stuff. I mean, Russ Barton was able to rent the bank space in a week. You know, he got somebody, we'll see if the florist makes it, you know, it's yeah. a lot of square footage for a florist in my opinion, but we'll see what happens. Um, you know, five Jane seems to be hanging on, you know, that's a space I think that's, you know, had, you know, had some turnover, if you will. Um, I can't quite figure out, Lisa, the shop in your, in your building, the, what I call the pawn shop. I, I have no idea how they make a living. I've never seen anyone in there ever. That's her, that's her office. Oh, okay. So she, has six, she has six locations across the state. Got it. Got that's it. an so office. Yeah, yeah. So that's again. Really, so that's, again, it's yeah. You mentioned exactly what it is. Yeah. Yeah. It, yep. You know, look at, you look at Bruce and Wilson who rent one of the spaces in the Pizza House building on the first floor. You know, it could be retail, but they use it as storage for their business, which is you know on Titus Road. Um, there's just you know. Which reminds me, does anybody know? I meant, I meant to reach out. The um, building that used to be Jim Kelly's law office sold, and was, then. And there was a sign, and then the sign came down, and I haven't seen anything go so, in there. Yeah, it was bought by a, a, a seasonal resident who uses it as his office for his company here in Connecticut when he's here. So he works out of there, you know, a week here and there in the summer. He um, is there, you know, maybe on Fridays. Um, but it's in that you know, whole it's a, space. It's a private office. Yeah. Okay. He, he, he had There's one this. other person. Oh. He, he just doesn't care, right? You know, yeah. he, he bought it from Jim as a favor to help Jim and he uses it and it's fine. Um, but yeah, is it being used to its highest and best use? Probably not. I would say office space is not that easy to rent still. I um, mean, you look at Ericsson, right? They went remote and took a little tiny space. Um, I have the space above the post office in front of uh, Dean Ada's business. It's been available for rent for two years and no takers yeah how much space is up there somebody was asking me the other day so uh, dean's only in part of it right dean's in the back which is about two-thirds of the space um i want to say he paid like 2300 or something like that and the front space i think i have listed for 1300 smaller you know shares bathrooms um but it's been recarpeted painted but it's upstairs, you know, and yeah. upstairs has traditionally been tough. Uh, Jake Assis has, I think, one space left, sort of, in his building. Um, there's nothing in Martinelli's building right now, although Steve Brown is renting two of the units. I'm sure he would go down to one if that was if somebody brought a, a tenant. Um, but there's really not a lot available right now. 
So, so that's a big part of the whole issue you're talking about here. You just hit the nail on the head. What? It's not a lot available. Well, there's the not a supply lot of is like there's also a huge demand. There's not a big demand either. That's a right. good point. So, so, right. so that's that's fine. I'm just kind it's of like slowed down. The whole market yeah. is kind of slowed down. And what is the cause of that? How to stimulate the market? Well, it's interesting because I don't know that there ever was a huge demand for commercial space because we're a small community. And as Lisa's saying, when they're not all here for COVID, you've got to have a you've got to know your business and know it well. We don't have a lot of foot traffic, as right. Kels was so, saying. You've so, got to sell a lot of stuff. So that's the you're you're hitting it on the head too. You've got to get with all the uh, places here that sell stuff. All the all the you know, all the people that have stores in town. And they've got to they've got to really push the message about what the town's all about. Well, that's what we you know? as EDC have been, that's been the goal of EDC right. is to promote the town, bring tourists, bring visitors. Really, really do that. Right. But you but not only it's more than just that part, it's you gotta cut them a break somehow. And you're are we doing that already too? Well, we financially we as a town. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Can you do that? Yeah, the, the town could offer tax abatements to people who start new businesses. You know, that's you, can, you can yeah. do tax abatements on personal property. That's all. You know, I pay tax on my water cooler in my office. I pay tax on the copier paper that comes through my office. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, a, you know, I yeah. you know, I mean, it, it's you know, it all it all yeah. adds up and. You know, I what I what I sort of worry about to of Lisa's question and Lisa's statement is, you know, if you go to East Hampton, three quarters of their storefronts are closed for the off season, just closed. They are mm -hmm. temporary businesses that are open from, you know, April to November, yeah. and they're just closed. You got just very few storefronts are closed. Well, Which they just is... don't make enough business to justify being open. <laughs> Right, yeah. which is the last, we don't want that here because for those of us who live here, we appreciate being able to go to the yeah. market in the winter. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's, yeah. I mean, the market stays to. open. So right? there's a disconnect there. Mm -hmm. Just what you said. There's businesses here that are very seasonal. Like he said, they're closing down. And then there's people here that don't want that. So that disconnect. If you can try and eliminate that, that's the way to go. That's yeah. the goal. That's the goal. I mean, that's the goal. It, if We're trying like, to get home dinner. Um, um, you know, and, and whether whether or not we wanted to try to encourage more seasonal, like people who want to have seasonal businesses here, it's really hard, right? There are few choices. They got to pay rent for the whole year. You know, I, I mean. I don't know where, but you know, if like there are towns that open craft markets in empty lots and they're open when the weather's good, you know, and people go and open their stalls. And, you know, I know it's a different kind of thing, but it is a way where I see local people working in communities where they're struggling to stay, stay, yeah. you know, be able to afford to stay. And so, you know, if the only jobs we create our hospitality education you know and service jobs then it's you know a lot of those are you know sub sixty thousand dollars a year let's say and it's just really hard to live here on 60 grand or less sure is. Okay, well which was the beginning of this conversation absolutely <laughs> yeah back to housing okay uh, any right, other well, questions thank you so much pals we really appreciate yeah. Your expertise. No um, Thanks, Phil. Did anyone follow else? Questions, just send them to me. All right. Thank you, and enjoy Thank the rest of your vacation. <laughs> Thank you. Back Thursday. <laughs> okay, we'll see you then. Thanks, Phil. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, let's. It's already been an hour, so let's just try to wrap up this agenda. Let's go back to the top. Um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of March 21st? No, so moved. Okay. We got Dan and Rudy. Does anyone have questions or comments or corrections? Hearing none, all in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. All right. Let's Aye. Say all.
Thank you, all approved. Um, the report, I just have a few things. I was away on vacation, so I don't have as much to report on this month. Um, new homeowner mailings for, for March, there were only three. I haven't mailed them yet, but I will get to that. So as we can see, the, it's been trending down. That's something we've been watching. Um, just quick, the newsletter, the summer newsletter will be going out in June. The, the um, due date for articles is May 11th. And thank you so much to Trisha who couldn't be here today, but she helped me um, put together a, a guideline, a sort of a one pager because we've had some new people coming on as, as, as article submitters, but also because we've had a space challenge. We've been consistently 10 pages and I've been having to edit down articles and cut pictures, which is a great problem to have. I love that we have so much great content, but um, we're trying to get some of the people who keep submitting these super long, uh, are, uh, it's like the library, you know, list of every last event. We're trying to get them to be a little more um, concise in their words. So, so that's in the works. Um, Welcome Center, and we put up the artwork right before I left for vacation. I don't know if any of you have had a chance to pop over there. I have one picture to share with you real quick. This is the, um, can you see this? It looks great. My screen's doing something Welcome funny. So yeah, so we've got our maps, we've got our QR code and our guidebooks up. We've got some of the historic displays up the last thing I need to do two things I need to do I need to finish some of the historic um the whatever you call it the keys that go with the work we're just finalizing some of that language and those will get produced and hung and the brochure um folder that's going to go right on this wall here under the map um we've got uh Anvil is going to make something for us to fit that space because there's a door that opens and closes right there and so we don't want it to get hit. So I'll keep you posted on that. But if you haven't had a chance to stop by, um, check it out. Thank you. Yeah. That was a, that was my first time I did the installation with Julia and Sultan and that was a, it was Can a good somebody day. go through there, get back to you if they're more interested? In other words, by scanning a code, can they contact Washington and say, boy, this is interesting. I'd like to know more. Yes. Yeah, so that QR yeah. code brings the QR code, right? That's right here. Yeah. Right? people back to the Explore Washington website. Okay. Which reminds me, I just want to tell you, I got an email yesterday from Julia at Explore who was asking to confirm the dates for the Harvest Fest for this coming October because somebody in Florida inquired because they want to make sure they schedule their trip to be here during the Harvest Fest. So she gets, so if they find Explore, they can contact her and she gets all kinds of questions That's about when things are happening, where are their bathrooms, where is there a playground for my kids? She she feels it all. So um, yeah, so that, yeah. Cuba, that, that brings it back to Explore. We've got the guidebooks there. So right. our goal was to be ready for the summer and here we are ready for the summer. And these are the displays on the wall here. Yes, yeah, so yeah. we did that. And there's one on the facing side, there are bathrooms in there and the water bottle filler is yeah. in. And I spoke with Liz, um, she's been doing the, uh, she's been doing the bathroom opening on the weekend. That's great. Really Thank nice. you. So yeah, so that was exciting. And hopefully we'll get the last bit, last bits up and finished before the summer season starts. So that's exciting. Um, Arts Council, um, just so they, they met while I was away, I'm still listening to that meeting and working on the minutes of that meeting. They're going to work, uh, they're going to run a logo contest. Um, so that's exciting. They're still working on the cultural district designation. Um, and I had spoken with Victoria, um, who's the chair about co-sponsoring, uh, doing the all right, let me back up. The photo contest that we've been running for Explore Washington, um, we had spoken at one point about possibly doing an art show with, with all of the great pictures that we're getting. And I thought it would be nice for the Arts Council to work on that with the EDC since that's their thing. And they were excited about that and looking to help us do an opening 
party for that. What I was really looking for help with was staging it since um, they are artists and so they can have thoughts on how to exactly. produce it and what it should look like. Um, so uh, so that was an exciting, I think an exciting partnership um, and that, that our photo contest would be in the fall because we're still running it as we speak. Winter closed, spring is open for the photo contest. So, um, but we have, the winners haven't been announced for the winter yet. I'll have to, I'll have to check in with Julia. There were, she shared the files with me, some stunning photos. And I think we had sort of gotten down to like our eight favorites, but we're trying to pick the top three. So I'll have to see if they, if they did that yet. Um, I see Fran is still here, so I won't say much about the WBA breakfast and business, except that the next one is May 15th, and they seem to be going really well, and I'll let her speak to that. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that the, the economic development was on the agenda for the last planning commission agenda. Um, interesting uh, conversations. A lot of what we've been talking about were topics that I suggest it be added into the next POCD. Um, so we will kind of keep you posted as, as that moves forward. Um, block party is June 3rd. This is the, the, the uh, co-sponsored by the WBA and, and um, Parks and Rec. And I just wanted to bring that up because it, historically we've had a table set up where we explain who we are, what we do, and we collect emails uh, for the selectmen's email. It, well, that's what we've done in the past. So hopefully I can find a few people to consider doing that with me um, on June 3rd, and we can talk maybe at our May meeting about what we'd like to see at the table. So just planting that seed. Um, last, last thing I wanted, I didn't, I forgot to write it down, but, um, Zoe from the pantry has brought up a couple of times of looking at some signage for the depot, um, sort of directing people. And actually Lisa and I have spoken about this too, about how people just sort of drive right by the plaza and don't realize that there's a market and a post office and, and, uh, amenities down in the plaza. Um, and so, so we, she wanted to take a look at that. And I thought the best thing to do would be to put together a small committee. So we said she would volunteer to work on that. I will, I thought maybe another WBA member and maybe another EDC member, and we could just kind of take a look, um, get some pictures, make some suggestions and come back to the committee. So, oh, you're right. Because there's a thoroughfare and it splits and then they don't look this way. Mm -mm. Yeah, they don't. They, they don't. don't. They miss they really the whole so they fact miss, that there's all there. They miss the plaza. Simon yeah. from the Art Association has asked me about this too, about being able to put yeah. something down there saying, you know, so that people can recognize that they're down there. Same for Titus. Not a lot of people realize that there's something stuff there behind yeah. parties and the hickory stick there. They face the road, but there's stuff behind them. So, um, yeah. So if anyone is interested in serving on that, committee of a small committee of four or five uh please let me know and um i feel like